Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast guide to the 1980s cultural phenomenon that was Miami Vice. My name's Dominic and joining me as always up in the Seattle area is my brother John and my sister Jenna in the San Francisco Bay Area. Jenna, let's start with you. We always like to check in every week to see what's going on in each other's lives before we get going on this latest episode of Miami Vice. So what's been going on with you, Jenna? Not a whole lot, honestly, just trying to keep myself out of, I don't know, like all the the crap on my news feed right now so it's been yeah. it's been a bad couple of days so yeah. yeah uh yeah i totally understand that john how things going up in the beautiful pacific northwest just trying to get into the uh swing of summer planning trips to the beach really uh, you at the planning beach? barbecues i, I know i, can't. I know it, it's it, it seems very unlike me but uh, uh i'm trying to uh branch out and do some different type of stuff this this summer and actually do summer stuff instead of <laughs> always working nonstop. Yeah, I definitely know how that is. Although, I mean, I guess it's not really much swimming in the ocean up in Washington, is it? It's more like observing. <laughs> so this is yeah, what pretty water much. Is like <laughs> when it's not coming from the sky. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> land water. <laughs> can, can, can we touch it? <laughs> Is it, is it safe? <laughs> well, and, and that and there's always the fear of going in the water and being attacked by giant squids. Apparently, we're the capital of giant squids. <laughs> really? Yeah, huh. I didn't know that. I just recently found that out. Is apparently, usually when they find giant squids, it is in the Puget Sound. So, mm. uh, another reason not to go swimming where I live. Yeah, I mean, we, we always go to San Diego every year, and... I keep hearing about these dangerous ass snakes that are like migrating from uh, like Japan off the coast of Japan and stuff. They're finding them on the on the beaches in in the San Diego or L.A. area, and I'm like, nope, I'm done. I'm like, cool, yeah, ocean's right over there. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. It, it, snake. It, it, yeah, snake. It's so funny. What are we, Australia? This is uh-huh. horrible. I'm not moving like anywhere <laughs> south or north. I may move east. <laughs> But that's it. I'm just gonna have to keep it. Uh, keep uh, keep my longitude. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I swear, when I tell people I'm from California, they always assume I'm a surfer. But I mean, coming from San Francisco <coughs> and Stinson Beach and all the sharks, mm-hmm. and then moving to Puget Sound, where we have not beach friendly weather and giant squids, I don't think I have ever once attempted to climb on a surfboard no no i mean i have a hard time standing on a skateboard so i don't know about standing on a board in the ocean yeah well Mm. let's get this thing going let's get kicking off on our breakdown of this week's episode all right this is episode six season one of miami vice originally premiered on november 2nd 1984 titled one-eyed jacks man we're gonna have a lot of fun with this episode because there's a lot of really funny stuff that happens in this thing this is it, maybe the most miami vice episode that we've that we've gotten like i think yes. what we what you were you and i were talking yes. about earlier but like what we've been we've been waiting for they finally gave it to us i've been waiting for it all my life you know <laughs> for so long for this moment (laughs) well let's just talk about how it opens because this like you can tell right from the beginning it sets the scene right our do our crime fighting duos out on a boat and they're doing a stakeout watching this guy who's like a bookie i guess you know or maybe next level up from bookie he's so i really thought the simpsons spinoff episode with uh oh yeah uh, big daddy with big daddy and principal skinner big daddy and principal skinner and And chief Chief wiggum Mm mm-hmm uh-huh. Like as soon as this episode began, that's the first thing I thought of. It's like, oh, it's Big Daddy. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's a super fat guy smoking a cigar, sitting behind the desk. He's answering phone calls, and it's like it's like the worst phone acting ever, right? He picks up like, yeah, two grand on what? Okay, yep, yeah, click, ring, hello, like, <laughs> like one after another. Uh-huh. So they're doing a stakeout on this guy, and they see this woman come in, and she's like, she starts to plead with him over like she has some gambling debt, and she uh, was calling Big Daddy. Big Daddy had taken his tools, like her or her husband tools as collateral for the gambling debt that she had which is like it's kind of cool that they use someone who isn't like your stereotypical gambler right it's just an attractive woman you know young Mm mid-30s maybe woman that is that has this gambling problem his muscle i I was a little confused by whether or not she's supposed to be a victim it is 
is her hut so she's the gambler she's the degenerate gambler from what i got from the beginning because she's trying to lay it off on another bet for miami yeah yeah Um, she wants to parlay it yeah but they also make it kind of sound like she's there on behalf of her husband which would make it sound like he's the gambler well they later in the episode yeah but later in the episode when um crockett's talking to the husband Crockett almost has a little bit of an attitude toward him, like, you knew this was going on, and you contributed to this. You know, you've got kids to think about now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It just But I think Crockett's trying to say, like, you knew she was a gambler. You should have been stopping her gambling. And Crockett has a vested interest in this because we know right after this opening scene that Barb is this lady's name, or Barbara, and Sonny ha- were a thing for a while. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. It just... It it just surprised me a little bit that we would see her as both a degenerative, uh, degenerate gambler and as the victim in this episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it definitely is supposed to be that you know uh, she's in over her head and that's why she's the victim, right? She just got out. She was dealing with the wrong kind of people, right? I think they're just trying yeah. to make her like a complex person, and that's a theme. That's exactly it. That's the theme throughout this whole episode is that there are subplots on top of subplots on top of subplots. This is a super complex episode that we don't get answers for like most of the stuff that ever happens in this and that's kind of why it's the most Miami it's the Miami vice episode of Miami Vice ever. So let's go back mm-hmm. to this opening scene. The muscle co- so Barb is there. She's dealing with Big Daddy. She's pleading with him to kind of roll this bet over. She's got she wants to make up the money that she owes him which is like eight grand. She's, she's going to make the money by doing another bet if, she, if he lets her carry it over. And while she's talking, this muscle, the, the quote unquote muscle comes into the room and he starts like pushing her around. The duo sees this happening through their stakeout and they take off. You know, they rush into the room. They take off in their boat and they run upstairs and they kick in the door. And it turns into like the most comical fight scene. Like it's like an old Western fight. So the duo kicks up and they're like, freeze, why yeah. are we PD? And the muscle, he like, turns and slowly like a- grabs those jelly beans <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, like it was supposed to be in slow motion but yeah, yeah. and then he just throws them and the guys are just like waiting for it like no hold on we got time we got time we don't have to we don't have to duck yet you see <laughs> you see they did so many slow motion scenes in the previous episodes that they couldn't afford it anymore so they just asked the <laughs> actors to move slower so i mean while muscles, recording like, throws the jelly beans at him and misses him and crashes against the wall right and then he just like lumbers forward like the big guy from happy gilmore like all slow, just like running up on the team, and they wrestle, and it turns. It's like right, they like wrestle downstairs, and this... trash the bar, and like yeah, they get thrown out the window, they roll yeah. down the stairs, and then Tubbs is like on his back, like trying to like judo chop him <laughs> in, the, in the neck. <laughs> I mean, they the Miami Dolphins need to sign this this guy because I mean, at, uh, at no point does he throw any punches. He is just simply pushing Crockett and Tubbs five feet at a time as mm-hmm. he continues to slowly walk away. Well, and I you know I know we spend and like an, an exorbitant amount of time on going over the cold opens that are for this show, but more often than not, it is like Maybe the best part of every episode is the first two minutes of uh, of of an episode of Miami Vice. Absolutely. <laughs> so much stuff oh, happens yeah. in the first two minutes. So when we come back from the from the credits, from the opening credits, they go to Sonny and Barb. They're walking along the water. And that's where we learned that details that we were just talking about. She's a gambler. Sonny and Barb have a past. And Sonny just wants to help her out. And she's asking for a favor. She wants, because uh, we find out that the guy, whoever this guy is, Big Daddy, he's affiliated with the guy that they're trying to take down. That's what they were st- seeking out for. His name's Al Lombard. She, in her gambling you know, habits, the person that she deals with, I think it's that she's dealing with DeMarco. He's got who's the, uh, who I think she deals I with. I believe she actually. It's De, uh, De not, not to interject, but I believe she's mm-hmm. dealing with the bookie Vincent. Okay. Yeah. So she yeah, she, she, that- she makes she she makes a reference. I'm dealing with so and so, but you know he's just figurehead of DeMarco. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I mean, we we basically just learned that who Barb is dealing with has ties, has direct ties to who the duo was actually staking out. And at the end of the conversation, Barb says, "Like I need my husband's fools back. They took him as you know payment for some of my back. I need to get back because he needs to go back to work." And it's just reminded again that Sonny basically does anything for a skirt. So he's like mm-hmm. a noir private 
a detective or something, right? Hey, now, he's just such a good guy, okay? <laughs> That's what it is. He's, it's, it's not nothing pervy. Sonny's <laughs> just an A-plus kind of pal, all right? <laughs> and then, so that's a short scene, and we jump to another short scene at the precinct where we finally meet Castillo. So in walks Edward so. James Olmos. He's taken over for uh, the lieutenant that got shot and killed, and so we have a new lieutenant, lieutenant in Castillo. And I... I'm so stoked about Edward James almost joining the show, and I can't believe how young he looks. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, in an Edward James almost way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just you know, I, I look at him in the show, all skinny and, and everything, and then I think about him, how I know him now, kind of short and chunky. I am super excited with him joining the show, but I'm also just kind of blown away because he he just he looks completely different than than what I think of now. And I can see. That you you notice in this thing that Castillo is going to bring something to the show that he's by the books, quiet and intense, and he's going to be that balance to Sonny, who's just like free wheeling, just shooting him up, bang, 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 bang. I'm doing it the Crockett way, right? Well, he's going to bring something else yeah. to the show, you guys. The Castillo stare. This guy has a better like. I'm not going to say anything and just wait you out, not not do anything but just stare you down. It's wonderful. But I, yeah. I think it brings a lot better dynamic to the show being that he's like the exact opposite of Sonny. He is very quiet. He is very in, in Whereas Sonny is very kind of to spur the moment, very mm-hmm. loud. So I think he brings a lot better dynamic as the as the boss, I guess. <laughs> I wonder, though, with Castillo, because he's got that long stare, and he does it so often now. It's just in this first episode, you know, going through the first, going through this episode, his first episode, right? Where he's so slow to talk. I, I seriously think he's he's got that stare down because he doesn't know his lines. And someone's on the side saying, like, okay, say, tell Sonny that it's not okay. And then Castillo's just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sonny, we need to talk. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you know, I've always, I've always felt like Edward James almost as an actor always kind of had a tough guy image, you know. And I never quite understood where that came from. And mm-hmm. I kind, I'm wondering if this is it. If this is like the role that started that, you know, reserved tough guy kind of image that he has now. Well, we go from that brief introduction with Castillo. He's he's in this episode a bunch we may not touch on it every time but you know know that he's he's just a quiet staring kind of guy and that's like pretty much all that we get out of castillo in this episode we jump well and i think he clearly Mm -hmm. hates uh and i think he clearly hates people in pink shirts he seemed to have a real problem with with sunny right off the bat you know and i think it had to do with that bright pink shirt he's wearing just Mm -hmm. distracting (laughs) (laughs) well we leave from the precinct and after meeting Castillo, and we go to poolside. Sonny is going, he's coming to talk to DeMarco, not as a, not really as a police officer, though. He's coming in to help Barb, you know, in that opening scene where she tells him about that she needs her husband's tools back because he can't work without him. He goes to meet with De, De, DeMarco, who, by the way, kind of looks like Pal from, from the Uncle Buck movie. You know, the guy in the bowling alley uh, where he's hitting oh, on the you're teenager. Oh, so right. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm and, never going to be able to not see that now. <laughs> and when we get to the poolside, there's a sweet montage of like just close ups on women's breasts in their bikinis, you know, going all around the pool. And it's set to the song New Girl Now by the Honeymoon Suite. And, so many mustaches. Yeah, I, almost, <laughs> yeah. I, almost, I almost think the close ups are a little too close. Um, <laughs> I, I think some of these women would be much more attractive from further away. <laughs> yeah, like macro lenses on the, I mean, I guess it's, you know, they're shot at, they're being a little bit more risque. So they're showing women in like, like this long, like a two minute stretch of just like fast jumps from bikini to bikini. But I mean, I, I we're laughing, but I paid attention to the whole thing. So <laughs> this is like, like that is HBO true. before that is HBO. True. Sonny's there and he's trying to strong arm DeMarco. He tells him he's a, he is a police officer and he's telling DeMarco that give Barb her tool, her husband's tools back or that he's going to clear off his docket and focus all of his efforts on trying to mess up DeMarco's world. So he's basically laying down a threat, like give him back. If you don't, like we're going to be coming after you. Shot. Yeah. And at the end of the discussion, DeMarco kind of understands stands and he's like okay whatever like sunny leaves and al L- L- lombard is 
there. And they, they, he just tells them, you know, DeMarco tells them, but like, I think we got a problem. And he leaves and just leaves it at that, right? And we go, we go from there. You know, oh, sorry, Lombard, just a quick side note. Lombard is played by Dennis Farina, who is like cop show royalty. He's been in a ton of cop shows, you know, through the 70s and 80s and the 90s. Like he was in a ton of stuff. He was in a ton of movies. You, for those of you that may not be into that kind of stuff, you recognize him. He was in Snatch. He's one of the uh, New York jewelry dealers. Yeah, and I think uh, the role that I think most people are going to recognize him for is his long stint on Law and Order because that's kind of every character he played back during the Miami Vice days. He's actually a former Chicago cop, and he guest starred in all kinds of cop shows, Hardcastle, McCormick, Remington Steel, even mm-hmm. another Michael Mann series called Crime Story. So, mm-hmm. But Law and Order, he was uh, one of the staple characters of Law and Order for years. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely, like, cop, like I was saying, like cop show loyal, royalty, right? Now, he's been in so oh, many yeah. great cop shows. That he's in this episode as well. So we leave from the where Sonny's just threatening DeMarco to give to get Barb's hu- husband's tools back. We leave from there. We have like kind of a weird scene where Crockett goes back to his houseboat. And, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it just goes back. And Animal Control is like trying to take in Elvis. Right. So they have him like, so- and, and Sonny s- pulls out a document to say like, no, like, look, he's an official police alligator. You can't take <laughs> him in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then you yeah, take so, him by uh- leash back to his houseboat. What I don't understand is that he has no problem taking him, and these people are tra- like trained animal control people in Florida, so there's no way that this is the first time that they've had to deal with a a wayward alligator, okay? Yeah. And yet they like can't get their shit together. They're afraid to put the the little harness things around its neck. Yeah. And they're like basically just standing, like sort of poking at him. What I love. What I love about Elvis is that. He's 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 like the frat boy of the show, right? <laughs> <laughs> he just gets it. I just imagine in my head like that what like what El- like so there's Miami Vice and then if you're to do a show about Elvis it would be like a show version of Caddyshack <laughs> with just with an alligator <laughs> going around like I I just imagine that 10 minutes before the but before we come in and they're trying to get Elvis the the animal control people are trying to pe- pick up Elvis there's just a bunch of old people in monocle saying like well i never right the whole thing was mm-hmm. just very weird and then they end up he takes him back to the boat and he's like he's on the phone and just tosses him a bag of kibbles and bits <laughs> like yeah. i don't think yeah, that's see, what that's, they eat <laughs> that, that was the two things that that i really that really caught my attention with this scene was that one he's supposed to be a drug sniffing alligator <laughs> and two that crockett Crockett feeds him kibbles and bits. It, it's. <laughs> I, just, I just so want to see a drug sniffing alligator. I think that's so. That's so good. Like that would uh-huh. be such a that would be such a Florida thing. Like you fly in and they just have them on leashes walking around the airport or something. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, and that turns out every about... small dog is sneaking drugs in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that phone call that you were mentioning was it's a call from DeMarco or DeMarco's people. I can't remember exactly what it was, but basically saying, like, we have Barbara's stuff. Come pick it up. And he's like, how come you can't just give it to her? Like, no, you need to come pick it up. So there's something fishy there. Before we go to that pickup, though, there's a couple things that happens. One is we go back to the precinct and internal affairs is investigating. Uh, sorry. No, yeah, me, that happened I got when, back up. No, yeah, because oh, he's at he's at the, yeah. like, the beach club or whatever. That's right. Because the pickup yeah, first, happens first. Yeah. 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 So the pickup yeah, happens. Pocket so shows Sonny, up. Sonny shows up to the meeting and talking with uh, the bookie, Vincent, that they he slips him and em- uh, Vincent slips Sonny an envelope, basically like making it seem like he's giving back money that Barbara lost. Yeah. And as soon as Sonny takes the envelope, IA steps in and arrests Crockett for accepting a bribe. Yeah. So they say that they don't have his tools. 
uh, they're just going to give her the eight grand in the value of the tools that way. And so he takes the envelope, just says like, all right, you make sure you leave her alone. And internal affairs is waiting right there. So DeMarco and uh, Lombard had called ahead to say like, hey, we have a guy that's working inside. You can come bust him right now. So Sonny gets arrested by internal affairs for taking a bribe. And we leave from there and go straight to the precinct. And inter internal affairs is laying out what they know. And it's basically all information straight from De De DeMarco and Lombard that they knew that they had someone in their department that was working for these for, for this for these racketeers and they exchanged immunity they wanted to exchange immunity for ratting out crockett and this is one of those dead stare moments from castillo where he's listening to crockett lay it out and, and castillo's not buying it which is where this character should be right that sunny can pull some shit and castillo's gotta rein him in okay but can we just talk about one small thing about that meeting uh why is the entire fucking department in his office while this is going down? Yeah, yeah, they, everyone's like, watching. Literally it. everybody is there. Nobody is working. That seems so inappropriate. Let's loudly talk about what we're <laughs> investigating about Sonny being a crooked cop in front of everybody. Hey, Better question. Why is everyone so orange? <laughs> is it just me or is everyone just over bacon bacon it i mean the the ia captain is orange oh but yeah. like dan had i is always orange <laughs> like in everything that he's in <laughs> yeah so before we go too far just to make clear that so there's another guest star in this episode and it's uh dan hedaya i think that's i think that's right Dan Hedaya, who's another crime show royalty. You know, we know him from a bunch of other crime shows. My favorite thing that I know him from, though, is, of course, Nick Tortelli from Cheers. And I, I hope, in my mind, I would love some fan fiction based around how Nick Tortelli is actually an internal affairs officer after he, or sorry, before he meets Carla. Well, I, would, <laughs> I would love for that to happen. Uh, we make a quick mm -hmm. jump after they lay it out and Sonny basically just lays it down like look you're not going to stop me fr from investigating this and he just you know we we end that scene as we always do with Sonny which like you're not going to tell me what to do you're not my real no, dad no. It, is it What's is it now? just me or <clears throat> does not does none of this change the fact that Sonny did actually accept the money so he did actually accept the bribe oh yeah oh yeah so I, I mean there's, um, I have a lot of stuff there at know. the end of this episode that I, I really want to talk about that is that it, it, in in reality, Sonny fucked up. He this is wrong. He took he did take the money. He used yeah. his position of power to blackmail yeah. DeMarco to get money for his friend, not put him in an investigation or anything. So but uh, I definitely want to go back to that because they blackmailed DeMarco again. It's like, let me get this straight. He blackmailed them and then they're blackmailing them again. But uh, let's wait till we get there. <laughs> I have so many problems with that. DeMarco gets just so royally okay. screwed in this episode. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> like, I mean, I realize you're not supposed to be like on his team or anything, but like he gets really screwed over. Yeah. And always do his gambling, uh, right? They ain't killing nobody. They ain't dealing drugs or anything like that. It's just gambling. That's all they're doing is gambling. We make a quick stop at Barb's house. And in this scene, it's, it's short, but you basically just learn that Barb's husband's a cool dude. He And he knows that Barbara's out, out, out of control, but he cares about her. He just makes a veiled threat. It's like, if I hear anything ever happens to her, there's going to be big trouble. We, we just like skip from there straight up to a poker room. And in this scene, this is supposed to be that Tubbs is starting to infiltrate the gambling ring for Lombard and and actually and, uh, Mark. actually and actually before we get to that gambling scene we have a short interlude of a scene where Crockett and Gina are getting busy as boat which mm. has absolutely nothing to do with the episode in any way that is but it was scene. so perfect and we're yeah. gonna keep it and we're gonna hope that they do it a million more times <laughs> yeah oh, that is I, see, I thought that scene. was between Okay. Yeah, no, no, this it's accurate because so basically Tubbs comes in and he's undercover. He's he's playing poker at the club. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to use playing poker and winning uh, and playing how poker is he? to get he's trying to use that so that he can get a chance to meet DeMarco. That way he can infiltrate their gang. Right. Like I think he makes up some story about how he's uh like a like a card shark kind of guy who works with the Italians in New York. In in Philadelphia, oh, okay. he, now, he how ran. Exactly, uh, is he under after the um? How is he? 
uh, undercover after the big WWE brawl they have at the beginning of the episode. With oh, one of the guys. Yeah. How, is he, like how is he undercover <laughs> after, yeah, after wrestling with one of the guys no. that are affiliated in front of another bookie who happens to work for the same crime organization. And yet th- now we're going to believe that he's under, uh, now that we're going to believe he's a, a card shark who works yeah, with the Italians. I mean- so you got to remember that Sonny portrayed the person who was going to kill Sonny to the people who hired that person, just like last episode. So clearly none of these people recognize faces. I think that's an actual psychological condition, and maybe it's just a popular <laughs> thing in Miami. But <laughs> like well, that's, that's obviously what's going on here. I'll just lay down what Tubbs is, what character's supposed to be. We know him as Jamaican. We know him as a police officer from New York. And some of his best acting is when he's acting to be acting. But he's supposed <laughs> to be... <laughs> <laughs> he's supposed his character who he's pretending to be in this episode to infiltrate lombard's gambling ring is that he's a racketeer slash gambling card shark kind of person from philadelphia who worked with italians and they got run out because De- basically because debarco's team moved into philadelphia or someone like that moved into philadelphia and ran them out of town so he's quality that's what he is that's why he 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 knows the italians and he's running a gambling ring but the only way his plan was ever going to work at this poker room is if he went there and won and who knows how the hell he did that but he won twenty seven hundred dollars mind you uh, i'm pretty sure he keeps that twenty seven hundred dollars yeah, and I was wondering that too. So we leave from there. Tubbs meets Demarco. They said he gives he gives Demarco his number after giving him his spiel about being from Philadelphia and being in the gambling stuff like that. We go to Crockett's boat, and we have a song playing in the background. We have "Wonderful Tonight" by Eric Clapton playing in the background. Sonny's kind of pacing around. He's depressed, you know. His 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 kids and why ex wife have moved to Atlanta. He's being investigated by Internal Affairs, so he's smoking a cigarette. Which, by the way. 80s is still an era where the cool people got to smoke cigarettes. And I kind of love that. I'm kind of sad that we don't have that anymore. And my fear is that the cool people in new movies will be vaping. And that would just be terrible. terrible. Oh, that would be awful. I oh, hope God. that doesn't happen. <laughs> that would be horrible. <laughs> oh. Well, so Crockett comes walking up to the boat and boom, who's there? Gina! <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so Gina is taking care of her man for a night. She knows he's stressed out and they're going to spend a night together. They're going to that- have the best rosé ever. It's going to be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that was one of the wettest, wettest kisses I've ever seen, too, man. He was just trying to swallow her face. <laughs> but you know what? Still not as bad as Tubbs, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no one can be that I sweaty don't... during sex, but we'll, if we already talked about that, Never I again. just don't think that. I just don't see how this is seen is, is necessary in any way. It was necessary for people who like joy. Well, that. You know, that scene is basically like Gina's taking care of son. <clears throat> she knows he's stressed out and she stays tonight. And the next morning, here comes Tubbs. I mean, he's whistling, sapping his fingers. He's jumping. dancing. Oh, yeah. He's in a great mood. He comes up. He's knocking on the door for uh, to wake Crockett up on his boat. And he's telling him that he won $2,700. And Gina comes out, too. And everyone's just like, cool. Like, I guess Gina yeah. stays the night here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought that, too. I was like, I didn't realize uh-huh. that, they were, that they were, like, openly a thing. But Crockett was like, oh, hey, Gina. Like, my, <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, she's, like, not wearing anything but a shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so... <laughs> And, kind of kind of open and that's the question that you're saying it's like he's he's telling sunny it's like he won twenty seven hundred dollars like we can split it halfway team do under if undercover police officers make money all on the job they get to keep that money that's, that's my problem vice we've, cop, you do we've, yeah we've already had one vice cop get bribed now we have another one keeping money he won illegally while undercover <laughs> Yeah, like are 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 our heroes falling apart in front of our very eyes? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that does call into question right? because Sonny was so heartbroken about the fact that his friend in like the first episode was taking the bribes and giving away information. Meanwhile, like they're all taking money left and right. Yeah, it's just that they're not giving away specific yeah, it, police it, information. Like that's the line. It I guess. explains. It explains how Sonny had. Such nice vehicles and so many boats. But aside from aside from that, I mean, 
Tubbs clearly pockets the cash, and then the episode moves along. That is just that. That's twenty seven hundred extra dollars, and later in the episode, has even more money. Oh, okay. So just moving us on, but we we didn't cover one thing when Sunny goes to uh his ex's house and talks with her husband he finds out that she's gone off like she got a phone call and she had to leave and he hasn't seen her since Mm -hmm. and he has Tubbs put out the apb right because he can't and then they're all sitting there on the boat and Tubbs gets or crockett gets the phone call that they found his ex barb has is dead and we leave from the the great boat scene to a swamp where they see that Barb has been killed and the husband is basically blaming Sonny for this. And, and Sonny's just telling him like, Hey, don't do anything stupid. We'll come back to that. This and guy- I don't blame him for blaming Sonny because I mean, at the beginning of the ep- episode, Sonny's like, Hey, we can protect you. And I mean, obviously they've done a bang up job protecting people up to this point. <laughs> I mean, you had to know as soon as he said that, that this bitch is dead, right? Like, there's, Oh yeah. People yeah, don't exactly. survive in Crockett's custody. I'm just, and I'm just amazed. And this, this is the part is after he talks to the husband castillo comes up and and me- mentions that she was shot five times in the back of the head five times in the back of the head at close range that seems extremely excessive <laughs> does she even still have a head left <laughs> like I, i'm sorry but you shoot someone once in the back of the head i think they're dead five yeah. times like wow this time it's personal <laughs> bang 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 <laughs> <laughs> also Uh-oh. i mean no offense or anything but like she is dumped in the everglades with what we're assuming is less than a whole head so <laughs> i have <laughs> i have to imagine that like that attracted some attention of local wildlife and yeah. like yeah. i mean how much of her are they actually recovering at this point well we're, we're, how do we're they gonna... actually know it's her Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> we're going to make a couple jumps here because there's you know, the crime scene at the swamp. Then we're going to jump to the Tubbs finally has a meeting with Lombard. His work, his gambling at that poker that night at with at DeMarco's club paid off. He actually got a meeting with Lombard. And so now he's been set up to be, he's going to work the gambling rings for the Latin and black <laughs> communities in, in Miami. And there's a quick stop at the precinct where, you know, Tubbs is telling Crockett that that's what's happening. He's going to go work to that. So let's quickly jump to that gambling scene where Tubbs is working this first night and it's it's they're doing cockfighting so I guess if we're racial stereotyping that Tubbs the black guy is doing the gambling rings for Latin people that of course they're doing cockfighting and DeMarco's there with Tubbs and and just so we can just so we can keep track of of this Trudy does appear in in a scene here she has zero lines but one serious face (laughs) (laughs) My favorite part of that whole scene is that Gina explains what Trudy found while Trudy is standing next to her. <laughs> and Trudy says nothing, just has a very serious look on her face. She's got oh, her Sorry, business. all right, let's let going. <laughs> She's got her business hat on, too. <laughs> well, this gambling scene is important just for the show, of, just because of Miami Vice important, not because it has really any that big a bearing on the on this show. But, but you have to know how much that Tubbs is a stellar dancer. Oh, <laughs> well, at the at, at this cockfighting ring, they go talk to the guy who's who's managing it, right? And it turns out that DeMarco and Lombard aren't actually running the gambling; they're more like muscling gambling rings into paying them for protection. And so they mm-hmm. talk to this bar t- this the the most unimpressed bartender slash cockfighting manager ever who 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 i'm pretty sure has the same mental disorder that that dude on game of thrones that just says hodor over and over again <laughs> has the same mental problem as him basically they're there to collect money from them and he's like so Tubbs like man i got this i used to handle this in philly and he takes up he takes this guy into the bathroom and he tells him that he's gonna pay his his fee, his six thousand dollars that he owes L- Lombard, and that if anyone calls to ask, he's given them six that uh, the bar that he gave them six thousand dollars that his payments made in full, and that this is important because we're going to leave from this gambling section to a club where Tubbs is going to go meet with Demarco and Lombard at the same time, and when we walk into the club. It's Jump For My Love by the Pointer Sisters is playing. DeMarco is there with Lombard. And Tubbs is cutting it up on the dance floor. <laughs> I mean, he's getting he's, down with his he bad really, self. 
he's going he's going all the way through it's like a it's like a nice passage through the decade too because he starts out with a very like john travolta-esque like at the disco kind of feel and then he goes into like full break it <laughs> like, <laughs> yes where maybe someone's just gonna toss a card some cardboard out on the on the dance floor i for had him. so watching him dance i had a sudden vietnam style flashback of watching breaking yeah and it was not a fun feeling <laughs> i laid on the floor in the field <laughs> position for 15 for 15 minutes until i finally left <laughs> God, the eighties was was just terrible, <laughs> terrible. I just what I it's so much dancing tubs in this episode. Like I can't handle it. Every time that Tubbs is in a scene, when he walks up to to the boat, when he walks into the precinct, when he's in the club, when he's doing anything, he's like, and he's doing that like that that Michael Jackson spin like clap snap feel kind of thing mm-hmm. to it. I, mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing. I mean, we should get more of that and less of him having any sexual interaction with another person. <laughs> <laughs> in this, this is an important scene because this is where they really start to just fuck DeMarco bad, right? So Tubbs gets lump gets gets Lombard one on one and he tells Lombard sorry, DeMarco gets it first. He tells Lombard that they collected four thousand dollars from the from, from the cockfighting, which is exactly what Tubbs had told DeMarco, hey, I got the four grand. But but remember, he told he had the guy who runs the cockfighting say he got six grand. So there's a two thousand dollar discrepancy all because Tubbs has made up this extra money. So DeMarco tells Lombard, hey, we got the four grand, everything's cool. DeMarco leaves, Tubbs comes over, Tubbs tells Lombard hey, we got the six grand. And Lombard's like, huh, DeMarco told me four. He must be pocketing four, uh, two grand. So DeMarco comes back to, to, to just, you know, they're all three of them are sitting together. Lombard's like, no, I got to go. I got to go make a couple phone calls. And Tubbs tells DeMarco like, hey, bro, you're screwed. I just told Lombard that you, that we got six grand from the cockfighting, but you only gave him four grand. This is basically a death sentence for you. And if you're willing to work with on this, here's the number to call me at. And he gives him a number and he leaves. And that's and see, a real and this fast is at the, And at this point of the episode, I actually feel like this is going to be our first episode where they don't kill the bad guy. Instead, someone actually gets arrested. But, I mean, they put DeMarco in this spotlight. Basically, dude, like, dude, you're going to get murdered. So you need to like we just we just wrote your death sentence for you. And Tubbs just justified that two grand he pocketed earlier. <laughs> yeah. When we leave from the club, we go to the precinct and Crockett and Castillo are having a talk and internal affairs butts in and Castillo basically just lays the hammer down on internal affairs. Hell I'm like, hey, I looked up Sonny's background. You're an idiot for thinking he would ever be taking a bribe. And he just, I mean, dude, he needs some he needs some aloe for that burn that he got from Castillo. And the internal affairs officer just leaves with his tail between his legs, which I thought internal mm-hmm. affairs was supposed to be there to regulate police officers. But he just laid the verbal bitch smack right on that internal affairs officer. And that's the end of that. So I guess because there's another subplot in this episode where they introduced it, but yeah. they had no way to end it. Yeah. And see, and I also thought during this whole time uh crockett is supposed to be behind the desk they're being investigated at no point in time is he taken off of the investigation or put behind a desk you know that whole subplot is kind of you, you know kind of starts and ends at the beginning of the episode and then mm-hmm. i guess this is just their way of like tying a neat bow around it like this is why we didn't care to go down this road <laughs> yeah right like oops we threw one story too many in here let's wrap this one up <laughs> yeah the internal affairs guy leaves and in comes skipping happiest you know the happiest guy in the world helps to tell them where where he's got demarco and tr- this is the only speaking line that trudy gets there so she comes in it's like speaking of demarco he's on line one and <laughs> So I want to take a minute for this right here. We have undercover vice cops who work in an office, right? They have Tubbs gives DeMarco this phone number says, call me if you have any questions or if you want to work with me, right? Call me if you're going to work with me. You're screwed. You're going to get murdered. When he calls, he, when Tubbs answers, he's like, this is Richard. So he's still working undercover. How the fuck does DeMarco not know these are police officers? Do you regularly call racketeering and crime lords who have a pbx system are there hold do they have hold scripts when you call for these people <laughs> they put what on the you, news app uh-huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you mean demarco uh-huh. called and you put them on hold what 
crime war ring do you call and they put you on hold for anything like this so, because you know yeah. it's a precinct so someone at the front desk answered like miami vice precinct number 476 how can i direct your call and he's like uh i want to talk to richard <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> right, thank you for calling miami police station would you please hold yeah. oh yeah 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 i want to talk to richard i just wonder <laughs> I wonder how this works because sometimes they get calls there when they're supposed to be working undercover and sometimes they get calls there as police officers. How do they know when people call how to answer the phone and what criminal is like no cool no worry i'm calling my dealer he put me on hold just give me a minute <laughs> but uh, how the fuck's their phone system work there it just makes me wonder did tubs go to him like if you want to work with me call this number nine one one yeah i mean we talked about it before where it's like hey call me call me at this number extension 378 if my if my extension's busy just leave a message at the desk like how does this work as your undercover police officers uh -huh. oh i i don't know anyways i don't know they say it we say at the precinct and they bring demarco in and when they bring the in, it's like i can't believe you were a cop and it's like what do you mean you didn't know he was a cop? When you called the desk, how did you not know when it said, when you called the phone number and you're listening to the voice message and it says like, the Miami Vice are here to protect you. If this is an emergency, please hang up the phone and call 911. And he's just like mm -hmm. hanging out like, we're just going to pick up any time. <laughs> yeah. huh, I, you know, I thought it was weird that I left a voicemail for Detective Tubbs. But, um... <laughs> All right, so this is where we see that they are really ramming it to... DeMarco. He's surrounded by police officers. They're intimidating him when he comes in. They sit him down. They're intimidating him into signing this form, basically saying that he made up that th that he was bribing Sonny. And it's twofold. He's got to sign this document to say that he made it up and it's going to release Sonny from this investigation. And he's going to wear a wire and help them bust Lombard. So let me. So let's back up here. He has to sign saying that he lied to police officers to to release Sonny from be, saying that he got a bribe. Then he's going to have to wear a wire for Lum, to to incriminate Lombard after. They framed him for stealing money from Lombard. And if he doesn't cooperate so in any of this, he's going to jail for 10 years plus. So let's clarify even more. They are blackmailing him into admitting that, uh, that they tried to bribe Tubbs. And they are blackmailing him into admitting that he is a criminal and involved in this gambling ring. So pretty much, we have just run the gambit as far as crimes that these officers could break in which IA, Internal investiga uh, Affairs, should be investigating Crockett and Tubbs. And this is, this is what I wanted to talk about from earlier. It's like, so Sonny absolutely did something wrong. He blackmailed DeMarco yes. to help a friend when the and the blackmail paid off. He he was willing to leave that meeting earlier in the episode with that money, with that cash, and go give it to Barb. That way they could that way she could buy tools. He used his position of power as a police officer to go blackmail a criminal to and to, was taking money from him. Then later blackmail him again for the original blackmail to reverse the original blackmail and then also give this man a death sentence. I mean, it, they did. Sonny is absolutely in the wrong here. Like he needs to be investigated by yeah. internal affairs. This is terrible what he did. Yeah. Uh, no, so, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, I think this is, this is the point in the episode where you really, you, you, can't help but see, like, Sonny has crossed every line as a police officer, and no one with authority in, in the Miami Police Department cares. Well, Which would be one thing if they actually got results from any of this, but they don't. Yeah, yeah, so let's let's go to the bus. Like, So how is this going to pay off? We go to the final scene of the episode, and this is like, you know, and a, this whole bus goes down really weird. So basically, Tubbs and DeMarco are going to go meet Lombard, and... DeMarco is wearing a wire, which Tubbs is going to be there, so why can't Tubbs wear the wire? But whatever. They go onto the boat, and there's there's cops stationed all over the place, right, as, like, re re regular people. They all have access to boats, so they, because they're going to meet Lombard on his yacht, and but they act surprised. So they, so Tubbs and DeMarco go on the boat, and then Lombard decides he's going to push off. So they're going to leave, and so there's this panic of, like, all the police officers are like, oh my god, he's... They're going out to the water so we can't bust them by running onto the boat. 
while he's where for, for, for what we hear from the wire so they call in like a code red and all the boats go chasing after after lombard and in on the boat S- su- surprise the, the surprise the meeting on a boat might end up out into the water <laughs> yeah so inside the boat things are going sideways too DeMarco's crazy nervous and he is not prepared for to and he like admits within like 30 seconds that the because Lumbar says like hey I want to talk to you privately because the white he starts asking him questions about how like who had Barb killed and so it's like I want to talk to you privately he wants to leave because he kind of su- suspects now that Tubbs is a cop and DeMarco flips out he's like look man they made me do it he rips open his shirt they made me wear a wire he turns around and there happens to be a gun right there apparently so he picks up a gun and he like turns around to like uh to to defend himself and I don't know how any of that stuff was there it escalated like super fast and at the same time barb's husband somehow hid on the boat and he's there he's there to kill demarco and there is we haven't seen barb's uh husband in a long time now in this episode and he just magically appears on that boat who knows how that he twist. do yeah it is a total <laughs> mystery on how he ended up on that boat yeah so and we get to the final scene where so demarco's got a gun he's got it out on lombard barb's husband comes in shoots and kills demarco and that right uh after or right before sunny flying up on his boat jumps from his boat onto the yacht and runs upstairs just in time to see barb's husband shoot and kill demarco and everything goes to shit demarco is dead now they have nothing on Lombard because they never got him to actually say anything. And Barb's husband is now going to be convicted of murder and they have children. So now the mom is dead. The dad's in prison for murder. So everything went to hell at, at the end of this bus. And and they can't keep Lombard because they didn't get him to admit to anything. And once again, the bad guy does not actually end up being arrested. Their their poor police work once again makes it so that the bad guy ends up getting killed and the victim's husband goes to jail and once and the guy that they are actually after does not end up in jail. How many times can they continue to kill off whoever it is that they're investigating before internal affairs is like Hey, we noticed you guys have a 0% success rate in actually arresting people. <laughs> yeah, but a 100% kill rate. Like, right. You, you have an amazing stat column if you were you know, playing a first-person shooter. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like it, you're it's playing just... Call of Duty in, or, and every time there's an option that says kill or let live, you, you choose kill. <laughs> you know, at, at a certain point, you think, you, you think people in the department would start, start wondering, like, like, why do people think that these guys are such good cops? They don't yeah. arrest anyone. Yeah. <laughs> they right. just murder. Like, families are just being ruined across all of Miami because these two come in contact with them. <laughs> and then it's just like, oh, well, that's just a nice, neat little package, and we're done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> play, the, play the exit mm. music. You know, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not, we're not going to have to wonder about what happens now that Lombard definitely knows who they are and is going to be back on the streets by dinner time. <laughs> we're not yeah. going to have to wonder about, like, the two kids, or I think it was two kids, who now don't have either parent present in the home. Like, they're just going to go into the foster care system. Like, the spinoff <laughs> That could be made. Yeah, those who cares are about all that? Have, those kids are going to grow up and have a serious fucking vendetta against Sunny. Like it's going to be like this crazy, you know, like uh, the, the the last season of the final uh, of, for the show, like the finale for the whole show. It's just going to be like one of these kids who's like, "You ruined my whole life. Like yeah. I went into foster care and I had all these horrible mm-hmm. things happen, and my parents are both gone, and it's all because of you." <laughs> and it would be totally yeah. like yeah, then no. we'd finally be like, "Oh, oh now they." finally finished the story we made it through like one whole story line. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah and so rather than answering any of the questions that we have up to this point in the episode and we end the episode with them going fishing yep so and, and, and i assume well, ends well yes and i assume while they're fishing they're going to discuss on on how they're going to spend that 2700 dollars that um <laughs> That tubs one down payment on another Ferrari. Uh, well, let's get so to- on a quick on a quick side note. The guy that plays the husband in this actually reappears in a later season, but as a different character. 
Oh, so be prepared a, for that. I know there's a handful of those. So I'm, I'm waiting for those to see if we could try and somehow match the two. Like try and make it like, no, actually, look, it's the same person. But if you just do this and that. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, let's get to <laughs> and talk about the music that's from this episode because we actually have a couple popular songs. All right, so this is pretty much the John segment. So let's give a quick rundown on the music that was in this episode. We have New Girl Now by Honeymoon Suite, Wonderful Tonight by Eric Clapton, and Jump For My Love by the Pointer Sisters. And so, John, you mentioned that this is the second Pointer Sisters song that we've had in the show. And uh, pretty much all of these are, you know number one hits that they just squeezed in yeah yeah pretty much all three of these songs are were top 100 hits at that time which falls right into what miami vice seems to be doing is they keep pulling songs from the top 100 charts we start to see that they like to reuse or they like to go back to the same artists so we've already had the pointer sisters i'm so excited and now we get Jump For My Love, uh, which, by the way, Jump For My Love was originally just titled Jump, but they added the For My Love part because at the same time, Van Halen just released a number one track called Jump. Oh. Um, so that's what the little asterisk is there for that. And then go further, we have New Girl by, the, uh, by Honeymoon Suite, in which I have a sneaking suspicion this isn't the only Honeymoon Suite song we are going to be hearing. It, it just it seems we have a trend of top 100 songs, whatever's popular at the time, being used. But we're also starting to see a trend is that they whoever it puts together the soundtrack for this Seems to like to go to certain artists that that seem to reoccur. So, and everyone knows "Wonderful Tonight" by Eric Clapton. I mean, that's just it's a classic. Yeah, everyone knows is, that. Right. Yeah, and which is just a a fantastic song. And actually, to be honest, "Wonderful Tonight" is the odd man out as far as the songs being that "New Girl Now" and "Jump for My Love" were both released same year, 1984, as the episode was released, whereas. Wonderful Tonight was actually released in 1977 before this episode was released and was just chosen just because it's such a uh, iconic song. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just perfect for the love scene that's with, between him and Gina on the boat. Yes. All right. Well, let's cap this thing off and go into our final thoughts. All right, Jenna, let's start with you this week. What are your final thoughts on this? The sixth episode of the first season, Miami Vice, titled One-Eyed Jacks. I loved it. I mean, this, like I said in the beginning, this really was like the episode that I had been waiting for. Um, because it wasn't it wasn't all just about like the weird slow-mo shootouts or anything like that. But it had a ton of story, uh, arguably way too much story uh, for, for its size. But it also had like really funny dancing and the opening the opening like fight scene was just so campy and wonderful and it was what I had been hoping to be getting out of this show like I guess I guess it's probably a good thing that I've been a little surprised that some of the earlier episodes I've actually thought were like good <laughs> um and not just super campy 80s stuff but but this sort of brought brought it back to me that whole like we like to watch things that are sort of so bad they're good um and and this felt very much in line with that john what are your final thoughts uh i would agree that this is probably most entertaining episode up to this point uh, and i say that as being the most entertaining episode with the main characters where it's not entertaining because of a side character or a guest star it's just every part of this episode is just stock full of entertaining storyline cop show you know miami vice fun this is like like we keep saying this is the most miami vice like episode that we've seen and it doesn't get we aren't distracted by the guest star or by someone else's performance this is just from beginning to end just fun with Crockett and Tubbs. And so I really enjoyed this episode and I hope 
going forward, more most of the episodes are more like this rather than what we've seen up to this point. Yeah, and I agree. You know, I had a lot of fun with this episode. I don't have much to add. You know, it is the most Miami Vice <laughs> Miami Vice episode. It's campy. It's fun. It gets serious. You know, like it's it's all around solid. I agree. I'll, I I want to know more about some of the other subplots that were going on in here. Like, what is Sonny and Barb's history? You know, what are um uh what about Barb's husband? Like, how does he, like I wish there was some more time. They've already done a handful you know we've already seen a couple of two-part episodes so this is you know i don't see how, if they could do another two-part episode to be too much so this had a lot of story but yeah i had a lot of fun and that pretty much caps us off for this week on uh go with the heat your culture your enthusiast guide to the cultural phenomenon that was miami vice so thank you thank you thank you to everyone who subscribed to the show so far we would love to hear your feedback you can get us at our official accounts on twitter facebook and tumblr just look for us for go, go with the heat you can email us at go with the heat at gmail.com or check out our website go with the heat.com where you can find all the ways you can contact us individually or the show we are just getting started we're having a lot of fun with Miami Vice and we'd appreciate your feedback or just giving us a thumbs up giving us a you know as we've heard other people say give us that uh, five star rating on your platform of choice that way we can have some more people find the show and we thank you again thank you thank you thank you for checking out the show and we will see you all next week bye pal stay cool people Thank you.